Uh, I am honored and um, before being honored, privileged to be here because um, I do adore the University of Chicago. It was a wonderful experience for me um, from 1976 to 1982, getting my degrees down at Hyde Park. And, uh, I, it was the, one of the great experiences of my life, um, and I'm honored to be able to teach uh, here as well, um, some weekday nights uh, throughout the year, and uh, I'm honored to be here to speak shortly to you as well. Um, I know a lot more about wine than beer, and uh, there are people, statistically speaking, in this room who know more about beer than I do, and uh, I defer to you if there are anything you would like to add um, in conversation with me later on, that'd be great. But uh, I did want to talk a little bit about beer because that's our, our topic tonight, and uh, it is Oktoberfest. We uh, styled the tasting after German beers because of that. We have German beers, um, and three of them, and we have one American-style uh, German beer as well. And uh, we don't have an Oktoberfest because we couldn't find any. Uh, all of Chicago has consumed them up, right? <laughs> Apparently, in Chicago, Oktoberfest happens in September, so uh, they're gone. Uh, there's some lingering on the shelves in, in uh, retail stores, but there, there's nothing at the wholesale level. So we punted and put together the best kind of list we can. I'll explain to you what the beers are and where they're located so you can avail yourself of them as well. Um, but when I started uh, learning about a beer, uh, much in the wake of my son, who's 29 years old, went to Boston College, and uh, uh, got the same degrees in college that his father got in college, uh, religious studies and philosophy, i.e. no job after school. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, uh, he, he loves beer, and he's very much taken our Belgian heritage up and learned a great deal about Belgian beers. He's traveled to some of the breweries in Belgium as well when he was away uh, for his junior year at Oxford, um, a great beer town, by the way. <laughs> uh, we routinely spend seven or eight hours a day uh, in Oxford simply uh, walking and pub crawling, and we'd have a, we'd have a pint at about every place every hour. So it was a, it was a good day, good father-son day, um, a good way to spend some, uh, time together in a great place for beer, England. But uh, his nickname is, 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 his name is Colin. His last name, of course, is St. John, but his nickname is St. Beer. And, uh, <laughs> He knows a lot about beer, and I've learned a lot from him. In fact, I learned something on the way over. I called him and I said, hey, what do you think is the percentage of beer that is consumed in our country that is controlled by the, by the big three, Miller Coors and, 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 and Heiser Bush? Um, and he, he has Siri now, so he talked to her and found out that 80% uh, of uh, beer consumed in this country is, is, is from those, those people. The, the other 20% are beers like the ones that we have here. And beer and wine, actually, um, as I found out by talking with Colin, are very much alike, and so I was very happy to know that, so I didn't have to really learn too, too much more. But uh, with wine, of course, you have the basic substance of grapes and their transformation during the process of fermentation into the liquid that we call wine. And with beer, there's very much the same kind of thing, except that you use grains, mostly barley, but a lot of wheat. We have wheat beers here tonight, for example. But the, the grain provides what the grapes provide for um, the process of fermentation, and that is some sort of sweetness, much of which in many beers stays behind in some residual percentage. So a lot of ales, for example, are, are, are somewhat sweet. Instead of acidity, the fruity acidity that fruit has, that grapes have, that they lend to a well-framed wine. Um, beer uses, uh, in beer making, they use hops to kind of give it that kind of definition, uh, the closure for the to the taste and some sort of dryness that snaps the taste to the finish. Beer without hops is, is pretty dull. It's worse than the beer in the next the next morning that has no carbonation that you found in the kitchen while you're doing the dishes. <laughs> you don't want beer without hops. And um, it's the yeast uh, that gives both um, uh, wine and and beer their, their fruitiness. Except in the case of beer, that's about all that you get fruitiness from are the are the different yeasts. In the case of grapes, of course, you have lots of different fruit flavors that come from the grapes. They're very similar, and they follow the same pattern with, with fermentation. Sugar, in the presence of yeast, is converted into carbon dioxide and alcohol. In some wines, that stays behind in carbon dioxide. In the case of champagne and beer, it stays a lot behind in, in the case of carbonation. Um, beer, however, is, the, is much more the grandfather of wine. Beer has been around for about 10,000 years. Um, it was probably invented by mistake because it doesn't, there's no reason that it would be, have been made on purpose. Um, but some Egyptian or Sumerian uh, baker probably uh, found a, a mess of dough that had been wet by the rain or by his uh, wife or slave misstep by adding too much water to the batch and that mass 
stayed around for a couple days and started to ferment with the wild yeast that are actually present in this room attacking, uh, not those, of course, 10,000 years ago, but the wild yeast <laughs> is attacking the, the, the starches and, and sugars in the, in the grain. And this thing started to bubble up. We do that anyway when we make bread and we let it rise, we let it bubble up. And um, um, he said, well, how would it, if, if I can't bake it because it's too sloppy, this porridge that I now have, at least I'll eat it because I don't want to waste it. And something happened after he ate it. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 most probably, he thought, well, what is that about? And so he said, well, it was wet bread, so I'm going to do it again. And so he did it up. And pretty soon after many, many thousands of years, people figured out that if you wet grains, and furthermore, if you boil them and you uh, do something with them, they turn into this really nice burpy liquid that gets you buzzed. And uh, they call that uh, beer, um, cera, cerve after cereal, cerveza, um, pivo, all sorts of different names. We just call it beer or ale. And um, that was, that's the history of beer. There are two major types of beer, ales, which are the original beer. They're, we make them even to this day. They're warm, they're fermented in the room, probably about room temperature, aged at room temperature. They, they're fragile, they don't last a long time. They're the kind of beers you get in England when they pull them up from the basement because they're not refrigerated except down there. And, and those are very, very traditional, mostly brown beers. Uh, lagers, which we're more familiar with because that's the kind of beer we generally consume or when we go traveling, have at a bar because almost every single country, even lots of Muslim countries, make lagers for the, um, for, for the tourist trade or for in their hotels and, and hospi ho hospitable establishments um, are, are date from the 1400s. So they're a relatively new invention. They're made under cold conditions, um, which has to do with the verb lagering, the German beer uh, word to keep things in the, in the cave, to cool them down. It's a slower fermentation because it's cooler. They're fresher, they're crisper and they're um, a new style of beer. But almost all beers fall within, within those two families. We have, we have both of those here tonight. Um, the beers that we do have, the Hello beer was a German Pils or Pilsner style beer. That is to say, a light, fresh lager that, has, that is highly hopped and is the style of beer that um, was named after the area was, was Germany, uh, is now the Czech Republic from around the town of Pils. Very old style of lager beer. It's fresh, it's crisp, it's highly hot, and it's a good starter beer because it doesn't take too much of your energy to enjoy it. It comes in at around 5% um, alcohol by volume. I'll tell you the alcohol so you know what tables to be careful about. <laughs> but, uh, that's our hello beer. The, uh, the beer that the business and professional uh, programs uh, is sporting are is an American beer called uh, Lagunitas Doppelweizen. And it is um, a beer styled after a Bavarian style beer, so it's kind of in the Oktoberfest family, but made with a lot of wheat and barley. So the double bison is double the amount of wheat. It's about 35-40% wheat, which is a really high percentage of wheat to be used in the making of a beer. And it's a double box, so it's not just a, a plain box, a heavy beer to start with. It's a double box. It's a big box. It's a big, big, big goat. And uh, so it's a big, strong, full-flavored, hoppy um, beer that comes in at 8.5% alcohol by volume. So as with all things business or professional might be for over there, be careful. <laughs> um, my people have uh, at the Arts and Humanities and Sciences table a, um, a beer from uh, near the town of Köln or Cologne, as we say in English. And Köln beers are called Kölsch, and it's from a very fine brewery called Zuners. S U uh, umlaut double N E R. And Kölsch beers are an old, old fairly obscure style, now being made in our country by some of our small beer producers. Um, they're, they're like a mild pils. They're not as highly hot. They're a little slightly sweet, um, and they're very, very soft and, and, um, and almost whiny in their aromas. They're kind of grapey, whiny to some people's minds. Um, this is 4.5% uh, alcohol by volume. And the final beer at the graduate studies table in the corner, in the cave, in the, in the back of the corner, is a schwarze beer, a black beer the predecessor to stout and porter that the English made famous. And it is called a black beer because it's black. It's a uh, dark, uh, very, very dark brown. Can't see through it in a glass kind of black. It doesn't mean, because it's black, that it's heavier than other beers. In fact, it's a lot lighter than other beers. Michael Jackson called this the black pills, for example. A misnomer in a certain sense, in a, in a hybrid term. But it's, it's black because the malt the barley, after it's malted and, and um, starting to turn some of its starches into sugar, is highly, highly roasted so that it's browned a great deal 
Um, the effect is the Maillard effect. It's a Frenchman who, who found out that if you caramelize sugars so much so that they become really dark brown or black, they get a caramely, coffee, toasty, chocolatey kind of character, and they make this kind of beer. Because there's very le little sugar left in the, in, the, in the barley, it comes in at a very low percentage, so it's, a, it's actually a fresh dark beer at about 4% alcohol by volume. It's called the Schwarz beer because it's a black beer from Germany. It's a German word. It's not Yiddish, it's German, Schwarz beer. The evolution of beer. There's been a huge amount of things that have happened in beer, especially in our country over the last few years. Um, all you young people know a lot about it because that's the beverage that you prefer to drink um, more than anything else, um, uh, more than wine. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, about a third of people in America drink beer. 